afternoon and welcome. My name is Susan Cohen and I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Alumni Relations here at Washington University. On behalf of the Alumni Association, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this edition of Wednesdays with WashU, a conversation with George Zimmer. Following the interview, we'll have plenty of time for questions during the Q&A, which will be moderated by Professor Hilary Anger Elfenbein. You may submit questions at any time via the Q&A box during the talk. Please also utilize the chat function to introduce yourself, share your affiliation and where you're viewing this from. When you send a chat, please make sure you select panelists and all attendees so we can all hear from you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Chancellor Andrew Martin and Mr. George Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer is chairman and CEO and founder of Generation Tux, an online rental platform for tuxedos and suits. He is also the founder, former CEO and chairman of Men's Warehouse, the largest retail retailer of men's tailored suit and dress casual clothing in the US and Canada. He graduated from Washington University in 1970 with a degree in economics. Mr. Zimmer will be interviewed by Chancellor Andrew Martin. Chancellor Martin was appointed Washington University's 15th Chancellor by the Board of Trustees in July 2018 and began his tenure in 2019. The Alumni Association is very proud to include Chancellor Martin as a member of the WashU alumni community as he earned his PhD in political science in 1998. Chancellor Martin and Mr. Zimmer, welcome. Well, Susan, uh, thank you for that uh, introduction. Uh, George, it's, uh, it's, it's great to see you. Um, it, it's hard to believe the last time, it's how long it's been since I was able to be in San Francisco and have an opportunity uh, to meet you about a year and a half ago. Let's, let's start with Men's Warehouse. Um, uh, I'll start there and then we'll move on to some new topics. What was your influence uh, to, start, uh, to start Men's Warehouse? Well, I was 24, so my influences were quite limited. But as I recall it, my primary influence was I wanted to write my own rules. I didn't want to work for my father or in any other way work for anybody else. Although as the end of my story shows, uh, I did have a uh, run in with my board, but initially I wanted to write the rules. So let, let's talk about let's talk about your parents. Um, you know, whenever you have an opportunity uh, to meet someone and learn their story, it's always interesting to go back to the beginning. You tell me a little bit about the influence your parents had uh, on you. You know, what were your parents like? What were they involved in? Well, I had a mother and a father, and I had four active grandparents in my. Uh, upbringing. So I had uh, six adults uh, as I grew up in uh, New York in the post-war era. Uh, my father was a uh, survivor of a POW camp in World War II. And my mother was the daughter of an orphan. So she was adopted uh, by a wealthy and prominent New York attorney. Uh, so my mother and my father both had experience with deprivation. And uh, I think through osmosis more than through direct uh, uh, communication, they transmitted to me uh, that it was important to overcome obstacles in life. So how did you make it from New York to Washington University in the 1960s? Just lucky. <laughs> uh, you know, in 1966, as uh, I'm sure you know, uh, Washington U was mostly about St. Louis area people. And uh, I think that WashU was making a concerted effort to expand the uh, uh, 
geographic dispersion of the student body. And I think I was uh, brought in under those uh, ideas and uh, it worked out well for both of us because uh, I got to watch you as a uh, 17 year old, somewhat naive young man and joined a fraternity and uh, began a journey at Wash U that um, people could argue continued right through my 40 year career at Men's Warehouse. So you, you launched the business when you were in your mid twenties. What was the first decade like uh, when you were beginning to grow Men's Warehouse? What were your biggest challenges? What were the things that were most complicated to deal with? Well, before I tell you uh, what, what those were, uh, I'd like to simply point out that part of the Wash U experience back in the 60s during Vietnam was that young people developed a great sense of confidence about uh, many things, if not most things. And, and that confidence extended, of course, into my business, even though I had had a liberal arts education. Uh, my major was economics, but most of my school uh, schooling was done in the liberal arts school. And I think only my accounting class was taught in the business school. Um, you know, the challenges of starting a business are primarily time allocation because there's no end to what needs to be done. And when you're starting a business, uh, you're basically compelled to work uh, endless hours and do whatever is necessary. And when you're opening a retail store, it would run the gamut from washing the bathrooms to putting neon signs on the roof of, of buildings. Uh, whatever needed doing is what I did. And I never really thought that uh, I was gonna be other than successful. So George, I know that one of the things that, that you think very deeply about, have written about, is the role of values uh, in business uh, uh, leadership. As you think about your experience at Men's Warehouse, you think about uh, Generation Tux and other uh, things that you've been involved in. Can you talk a little bit um, uh, about, about values? Uh, I know you've written about stakeholder capitalism and, and shareholder capitalism. Um, can you maybe share with us your perspective on that? Well, I was fortunate in, in that I was a student in the 60s. And so the values that were being injected into society uh, lend themselves to uh, slogans like make love, not war. And uh, people over 30 uh, can't be trusted. And so those were the values that I brought with me to starting the men's warehouse. And it turns out that although they were quite unusual back in 1973, and even when we went public in 1992, I would say that capitalism was still in the model of Milton Friedman and uh, maximizing shareholder value, not what I call stakeholder capitalism, which some people call conscious capitalism, but it, it's really one and the same. It means that all the people who have a vested interest in the outcome of a, of a business, whether it's the employee group, the customer group, uh, the investor group, which are the shareholders, the wider community or the environment. And in, in my example, I include the suppliers as well. 
that all of the stakeholders have a vested interest in how the company obtains the results that it does obtain, uh, i.e., what is the methodology that the company uses? And uh, over my career, I found it was pretty simple to find solutions to business challenges that would benefit two or more stakeholder groups at the same time. And, and that's how I built Men's Warehouse. So uh, one, of the, one of the issues where you've spoken about has to do with executive compensation. Um, yeah. and, and I know that our, I know that many of our alumni would be interested uh, to hear your views on executive compensation. So as we think about think about business today, um, what should boards be thinking about uh, when they're thinking about compensating their chief executive? Well, as uh, anybody who's ever been a chief executive knows, uh, we get far too much of the credit when things go well and far too much of the blame when things don't go well. And uh, when I was running Men's Warehouse, my compensation was only 12 times the average uh, store managers. Hmm. Today, if I were still there, uh, that would be uh, north of 100 times what the average store manager got. Uh, what, what I've always said is that if you've got a founder involved as opposed to a, uh, a hired CEO who is in effect playing with the house money, um, you're more likely going to get more bang for your buck out of a founder, although uh, lots of smart investors would say that if you stay with a founder too long, you run the risk that they uh, get in over their head, which some would say happened to me. Mm -hmm. So let's let's move forward by another 25 years or so and talk about the end of your tenure at Men's Warehouse. What happened? Well, to begin with, uh, I didn't do anything wrong. I know a lot of people probably think that I must have done something horrible to have uh, be the founder of a company and, and be removed as I was. The fact is that the uh, man I had appointed as my successor, who I had hired uh, uh, almost 20 years previously as our tie buyer uh, from Macy's, San Francisco, uh, basically went to the lead director of the board and said, we can't have two guys running this company. You got to pick me or George. And I, I think they uh, made their choice very clear. And I was uh, uh, probably more unhappy at that time in being uh, fired. But uh, when I look back on it today, um, although it did not work out for Men's Warehouse, uh, I don't really resent what they did. Uh, I, I, I regret that they were not more careful in their approach. Well, in, in, addition, to, in addition to moving along the CEO, they also lost their spokesman on television. Uh, which was so important to the brand of the company. Well, they did not really understand that. And when you're being asked to uh, leave, it doesn't behoove you to say to them, uh, what about our television campaign? It, it becomes their problem. And, and, and I think by their chapter 11 bankruptcy filing, it's pretty clear that, uh, their, their Harvard Business School graduates who never had the benefit of a WashU liberal arts education. So I have one more business question and then we're going to turn to politics. Uh, so could you talk to, uh, uh, talk to us a little bit about Generation Tux, uh, uh, about the nature of the business, how you've been doing through COVID and what you see the future looking like? 
Well, thank you for that question because uh, that's what I've been working on for the last uh, five or six years. And we are just coming into our own and we're going to make our first profit this year. Of course, that has a lot to do with the pent up demand uh, to get married from last year when COVID shut most weddings down. So our business is going quite well now and we look for it to be uh, quite robust indefinitely into the future because uh, the reason I went into this business uh, after having uh, led Men's Warehouse was that this business has an extraordinary uh, margin, uh, gross profit percentage, so that once we get to profitability as we now are, it becomes enormously uh, profitable and we think is going to be worth hundreds of millions of dollars uh, rather quickly. So uh, I, I thought like, like most homo sapiens, it was just plain old fashioned greed that drove me into this, I think. So let's go back to your student days. You were uh, an activist. Uh, when you were a student uh, here at Washington University during the Vietnam War. Tell us a little bit about your involvement, why you became so passionate about politics and what's that's meant to you. Well, and I say this uh, knowing uh, full well who I'm speaking with, uh, it seemed to me that uh, in the mid to late 60s and, and then on, uh, into the 70s beyond then, uh, what was exposed in American society was the inadequacies of uh, things like the rule of law and uh, the jury trial, which were two of the pillars of uh, really the creation of the American experiment. And as I came to understand that uh, many of the institutions and the leaders of institutions, whether it was uh, high school or college teachers or religious leaders, political leaders, uh, did not really know uh, much more than the students knew. They just acted like they knew a lot more. And uh, that philosophy has stayed with me throughout my entire adult life. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I consider myself uh, an optimist, but uh, I do enjoy cynical dialogues. So I'll, let's open up a cynical dialogue. I'd say January 6th of this year uh, mm -hmm. was one of the more complicated days in American history. Yes, uh, with with regard uh, to the health of our democracy. And I think as a society, we're continuing to process that event. It's going to have implications for electoral politics, I suspect, for at least a generation, if not more. What are your views um, of the health of the American democracy today? I think it's teeter tottering. And uh, if I were a betting man, I don't think that it's better than 50-50 that uh, the American democracy, uh, uh, if you refer to it as an experiment, uh, is successful. It may, uh, under the weight of our own inadequacies, I mean, let's just talk about uh, white supremacy uh, to start with there is a current of white supremacy that has run through America since our founding. It included the Dred Scott decision in St. Louis uh, and many other uh, uh, aspects from Jim Crow to the uh, current debate on the voting rights filibuster discussion 
that is going on in the United States. I do not think that average Americans were involved in the January 6th uh, uprising. Uh, what I believe happened was that people like the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers who are essentially white supremacy organizations took the opportunity uh, to uh, combine with what Donald Trump was looking for to make the problem of January 6th. But uh, we do have a problem in America when 74 million people voted for Donald Trump on election day, there must be a strong undercurrent of white supremacy in this country that as a Jew, uh, I have been involved with uh, from the periphery a little bit. Uh, but now that we see what happened in Atlanta with the uh, Asian hate on top of some of the other things that have happened, I do worry about uh, whether America is going to survive becoming a minority majority country. I don't know if that's in the cards or not, 50-50. So George, one of the classes that I teach, I've taught twice, I'll teach it again next academic year, is called Free Speech on Campus. Um, and we teach, uh, you know, we, we talk a lot about law, and then talk a lot about policy uh, regarding free speech. Of course, the free speech movement begins on college campuses at Berkeley uh, back in the mid 1960s, sort of spreads across American college campuses, part of the civil rights movement. Of course, today, the discussion about free speech tends to be quite a bit different. Have, have your views on free speech evolved over time? Uh, was this something important to you as a student activist or was it at the periphery? Well, no, it was always important uh, uh, 50 years ago. And I don't agree with much of the progressive dialogue on free speech today. I took the position many years ago, I'm sure you remember when the American Nazi party wanted to march through Skokie, mm -hmm. Illinois, and the ACLU defended their right to do that. And I, I think that uh, whether it's Donald Trump's right to be on Twitter or the Nazis' right to march in Charlottesville or Skokie, uh, that that's essential to free speech. But it does have to be balanced with what has emerged in the uh, modern era, the cancel culture, as an example. I'm, uh, I, I'm worried about that because uh, too much of it is inaccurate. So we had a chance to talk a couple of weeks ago and we talked about the rule of law. Um, and you have strong views um, about, the, about the rule of law, the extent to which uh, uh, it's important, the extent to which it's used by those in political power to suppress minorities. Can you maybe share your views on the rule of law? Well, I, I, it, it's, to me, it's, it's self-evident. Uh, you know, the problem is that we, uh, we, we hear almost every night on television stations about the sanctity of the rule of law. But people are afraid to challenge the rule of law. The most basic challenge, I think, is, is something like the bail system, mm -hmm. which was part of the Jim Crow system to uh, make sure that uh, white supremacy had a statistical advantage and minorities were held in jail until they could make bail. As you know, uh, up at Rikers Island in New York City, uh, people are held in jail for as much as two years without actually having a trial in which their uh, guilt or innocence can be determined. And there have been unfortunate cases of young men uh, being released from Rikers 
uh, never having had a trial and then committing suicide. So it's an example of how the rule of law as we hold it uh, 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 nobly as, as a pillar of American decency can be used by the status quo against the people without power. Mm -hmm. Well, George, I appreciate you spending the time with us. I'm gonna turn things over uh, to, my, uh, to my colleague. It's always great to hear your perspective on both business and politics and wish you uh, the best of luck in years to come and look forward to seeing you on the West Coast, hopefully sometime uh, really soon. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce and welcome uh, Dr. Hilary Anger Elfenbein, who's gonna be moderating today's Q&A and take questions from the audience. Dr. Elfenbein is the John K. Wallace Jr. and Ellen A. Wallace Distinguished Professor and Professor of Organizational Behavior. Uh, she has been a business school professor at the Olin School of Washington University since 2008. She holds a PhD in organizational behavior, a master's degree in statistics, and undergraduate degrees in physics and Sanskrit, all from Harvard uh, University. Her, focus, her research focuses on emotion in the workplace with particular emphasis on emotional intelligence and on cultural differences in emotion that can create challenges to working in global environments. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hilary Anger Elfenbein. Hilary. You're on mute. I like to say it's not a party until someone speaks while they're on mute. <laughs> So, so now we have a party. Um, Mr. Zimmer, it's such a treat to meet you. And uh, there's a lot of enthusiastic questions for you from the audience. So if I could ask you, actually, the first question I've been wondering a lot about too, because um, how do you transition to a world of casual dressing with the work from home situation? So a lot of us have stopped wearing the clothes we used to wear. I can tell you personally, I don't know if I fit into all of them at this point um, with the COVID-19, so to speak, um, during the COVID-19. So how do you transition? How do you, how do you go along with that kind of a major shift in how people dress? Well, thank you first for that question. Uh, as you can see by my dress today, uh, I'm just wearing uh, a sweater and a pair of slacks. So I, I do think that uh, in the world of Zoom, uh, if you're wearing a coat and tie, it, it probably looks inauthentic. <laughs> it probably looks... More Except on Andrew Martin. There it looks fabulous. That's right. Uh, but that's, and that is exactly the point. For most of us who are working from home, uh, Andrew was in an office setting. And so his tie was more appropriate. If I were wearing a tie now, and I'm saying this for all the people that are on the call that I think it's perfectly okay to be dressed down on, on Zoom calls. Now, having said that, the good news about having been fired from Men's Warehouse is I no longer have to care about how people are dressing down. Uh, I'm in the wedding rental business, and now that people are going to be getting married in large groups and wearing either tuxedos or suits, my business is gonna prosper. Fantastic. So another question that came in, and by the way, let me ask the attendees, please toss your questions into the Q&A. We're delighted to read more of them. So another question that came in, after COVID-19 is tamed, to what extent will consumers shop in brick and mortar stores versus online? And can you establish a brand using an I guarantee it type of strategy in the new online world? Well, thank you for that because I hope I can establish a brand in the online world because that is the world I'm entering. 
Uh, there are no bricks and mortars stores as part of Generation Tux. It's 100% online. I think that online is the future and that after we tame COVID, as, as you suggested, uh, we will see a resurgence in bricks and mortar, but it will never replace online as the end game of retail shopping. And so I'm extremely uh, bullish about the prospects for Gen Tux. And yes, I, I probably had that in mind when I opened the company. <laughs> Fantastic. So a question that just came in, um, whether work from home and subsequent returning to the office, do you believe that that will create a shift in business dressing more generally? Will we have a wider acceptance of a range of what's considered professional, even when we're back in the office? So let's see if I can explain this uh, correctly. Uh, for Many, many years now, it's been almost 50 years since I started Men's Warehouse. And I'm very familiar with the clothing habits in America going back 100 years. And the per capita use of men's suits has been going down since President Harding was in office. So this is a fairly constant slope that is not really changing. So the fact that men are wearing suits less often doesn't mean that they're not wearing them at all. Uh, so unless you're talking about very selected professions like chancellor of a major university or uh, a lawyer that argues in court regularly, uh, most men still want to own one or two suits and just wear them less often. But my ultimate solution for this problem is to recommend that men rent from Gen Tux on those rare moments where they want to be dressed in a suit. We have a program under development called the Suit of the Month Club for just that reason. Fantastic. Well, a few questions have come in about fraternities. So some of them are indeed from your own classmates in the class of 1970. Uh -huh. um, I, I won't out who they are, although actually I think their name may be in the, the major chat. So let me ask, um, a question came in, actually several um, about this. So did you or any of your peer group influences in your fraternity help inform your business success? Well, my nickname in the fraternity, uh, which at the time I did not like or understand, was chairman of the board. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Well, they, they, they saw that coming. Um, another question came in around sustainability. So tux and suit rentals are more sustainable in the apparel and textile industry. And so can you discuss a little bit more about it, the expansion of this model in the broader fashion industry and what implications it has for manufacturing jobs, for price points, and for selling consumers on the new model? Well, thank you. That's another great question uh, uh, indicating that Generation Tux has a noble future. Uh, unfortunately, the honest answer that I would give is that the uh, impact on the environment from renting apparel instead of owning it is, is really going to be decades in the future. And that uh, if you're concerned about global climate change, uh, I wouldn't wait for the rental of uh, suits to make an impact. And 
what about uh, about manufacturing jobs? Do you see that also as not potentially making an impact, or or is that is that also just a drop in the bucket? Many years after you get your first electric vehicle, we'll look about that problem. <laughs> And I've had mine for only four years now. Uh, so another question came in around um, around uh, cons around conscience. So following the emotional and logistical disruption for employees due to COVID nineteen and responses to the killing of George Floyd, many companies have committed to increasing employee wellness and psychological safety. And the the, the questioner wants to know what is your take on how corporate leaders, especially those working for large US-based global corporations, how can they make good on the kinds of commitments, public commitments that they've been making? Well, since I did uh, major in economics at WashU, let me give you an answer that is based on economics. I think the biggest problem in corporate America today is income inequality. Now, the problem existed when I started Men's Warehouse and it existed when they asked me to leave. But I do believe that income inequality is where corporate CEOs need to focus and, and not so much on things like diversity training, you know, to pick up on your uh, reference to George Floyd. Not that that isn't important, but at the end of the day, I think that poverty is what causes more problems in America than the lack of diversity. And related to that, how can income inequality be reduced? And in particular, this outsized executive compensation that you've talked about, com comparing executive compensation to the average wage earner is, it's remarkable how much it's increased and what can be done to fix that? Well, I'm a member of a group called the Patriotic Millionaires. And one of our big issues right now, which is not going particularly well, is the minimum wage. Now, as you know, the minimum wage in America is $7.25 an hour. Now, there are many states that have a higher minimum wage. That's the federal minimum wage. The plan that is being discussed in Washington is to raise the minimum wage between now and 2025 to $15 an hour. So that next year it would go to 850 and the year after that it would go to 950 and stair step up to $15. I, for the life of me, as somebody that used to employ 17,000 hourly employees, cannot understand why more Americans uh, do not support raising the minimum wage because it will do more to reduce income inequality than any other single act we could do. Fantastic. The next question I think will be near and dear to Andrew Martin's heart. So um, one of the one of the uh, viewers asked, how much did your WashU education contribute to your success in business and how? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> Andrew, uh, let me try to articulate this carefully because it's not uh, commonly understood, in my opinion, how important a liberal arts uh, Wash U type of education does contribute to an individual's ability to build and run a successful business. I opened one store with three employees and grew it to a chain of 1,500 stores with 17,000 employees. 
And because of that one class I took in accounting at WashU, I was able to understand financial statements for 20 years as a public company. So I think that one of the big mistakes that uh, hedge funds and private equity companies are making is they're looking, and forgive me for those of you from business school, but we should be looking to liberal arts for our CEOs because balancing all stakeholder interests and not just focusing on shareholders requires a liberal arts education. I guarantee it. <laughs> so one of your classmates asked, what is your advice for new college graduates entering the business world? And the answer is not plastics. No, the graduates, which was also instrumental in my business success. Oh, uh, no. Well, you know, I have two children in college right now. And I, I must say, uh, if I weren't uh, successful, I would have a little bit of concern for them right now because of COVID. And it does seem to have changed the uh, outlook in society. Uh, since I'm now mostly retired, I haven't really thought about that question as, as much as I probably should. Fantastic. Well, let me ask, um, there's one question left, but it's definitely a last question to ask. Anything else in the Q&A? Anyone want to put anything else in the Q&A? Okay, actually, here's, here's a nice one. Um, so, um, this this um, audience member would like to know more about your tuxedo venture in particular, how it's differentiated, and whether you expect to roll up a lot of local mom and pop type shops that rent tuxedos. Absolutely not. There's plenty of business for everybody. Unlike when we did this at Men's Warehouse uh, beginning in 1999, and, and we did have an adverse impact on many mom and pop shops, uh, this will, will not be the same type of business. Um, My biggest disappointment with Generation Tux is because it's an online business, we have less than 100 employees. So I don't get the opportunity to demonstrate uh, stakeholder capitalism the way I did at Men's Warehouse, which uh, not only was a labor of love, but because it involves so many people that became a, a, an extension of a large family reunion. Uh, this business is, is very different and is uh, more intellectual and, and less about stakeholder capitalism. Great. So another question came in, which is about, um, so Tacova's boot company has been successful selling Western boots online, but getting the right size has always been a problem with a lot of time returning and resending products. So how do you do this with tuxedos? It's hard to size up body measurements. So first of all, 75% of our business is not tuxedos, it's suits. So people getting married today uh, dressed down by going from a tuxedo to a suit. Now, the question about fit. Um, I used to think of myself as the Pied Piper of tailors and originally tried to build a company uh, called Z Tailors that would operate uh, in collaboration with Gen Tux. But unfortunately, 
I didn't have enough money to do that. And uh, we had to abandon that opportunity. Trying to get any garment to fit is a challenge because everybody's method of measuring is slightly different. So we finally created an algorithm which gets 85% of the fit correct. And we send the garment to the client two weeks before the event. So if there is a problem, we have the opportunity to send FedEx a replacement garment that fits appropriately. So we can only get 85% right, even with a sophisticated algorithm. Fantastic. Well, I, I have one last question, which was that I was told you definitely cannot let the interview end without asking him to say, you know what I'm about to say, right? Of course. Personally, I guarantee it. You're going to like the way you look. I guarantee it. <laughs> Fantastic. Mr. Zimmer, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to turn this back over to Susan Cohen, and uh, I really appreciate your time. This has been fun. Enjoyed it. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Zimmer, Dr. Elfenbein, uh, Chancellor Martin. We so appreciate you being here today. Um, Mr. Zimmer, I wanted to let you know, I don't know if you saw the chat coming in, but a number of your classmates joined us today. Uh, those names that I saw were Michael Sullivan, Ira Moses, Marv Perlstein, Dennis Wolf, and Keith Kretschmer, who said he was a fraternity brothers of yours too. Um, so I know they all say hello. Um, and so fond of you, and they were so happy to hear from you today. So thank you for spending your afternoon with us. Uh, for all of you, thank you for joining us tonight. We hope that you will, oh, and we have a Bob Newman says hello as well, I think from California. Uh, for all of you who are here with us, save the date for our next Wednesdays with WashU on April 21st, featuring art collector Komal Shah who will discuss her passion for collecting art and uplifting the work of unrepresented artists. She will be joined in conversation uh, with Carmen Colangelo, Dean of the Sam Fox School, Vice Provost and Adrian Davis, and Sabine Ekman, who is the Director and Chief Curator of the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum. Thank you all, and we hope to see